It's an exhilarating day here for us at the Jamaica Information Service as we stand with many around the world in observing International Nurses Day. We salute all those consistently diligent nurses who continue to display that deep underlying passion to serve and serve well. Your efforts, especially in a period where we battle a global pandemic, are noted and appreciated. Speaking of that pandemic, general COVID-19 information and work from home safety tips continue to drive much of the narration of this program. So welcome to Jamaica Magazine, I'm Theodore Henry. Let's disclose the detailed contents right now. Today I'm Stephen McHugh and this is your JIS News for Wednesday, May 12. The business process outsourcing BPO sector is projected to return to its pre-COVID-19 peak. That's the indication given by Minister of Industry, Investment and Commerce, Audley Shaw, during his contribution to Tuesday's sectoral debate in Parliament. Despite initial challenges with layoffs in the height of the pandemic, he says the sector has been able to recover with about 3,000 new BPO jobs expected in the near future. Mr. Shaw is attributing the rebound to government's quick action in approving the sector as an essential service and allowing temporary work from home arrangements. This significant change represents a major triumph for the industry, enabling the sector to rebound, resulting in rehires and expansions of existing clients, as well as increase in the progression towards higher value-added outsourcing services. In fact, Madam Speaker, the industry has portrayed some significant signs of, of recovery and is on its way to returning to its pre-COVID peak with every indication that it will pick up on its previous trajectory of 16 to 18 percent growth per year. In the meantime, the productive sector is in line to access $5.5 billion from the Exim Bank. The bank is also setting aside an additional $600 million to provide affordable financing for micro, small and medium-sized enterprises, MSMEs. Just over $200 million will be immediately transferred as a result of the closure of MIDA and a further $400 million will be made available later this year. The Ministry of Environment and Climate Change is developing a pilot resource efficiency program for the public sector. Portfolio Minister Pernell Charles Jr. made the disclosure recently. He says the project is aimed at promoting environmental stewardship. The program is design, designed to facilitate the procurement of environmentally friendly products, to encourage recycling as well as uh, to increase the conservation and efficiency of the utilities use within the sector. Minister Charles Jr. says it will be used as a model to build out similar programs across all sectors. The goal at our ministry is to build out a national network, Madam Speaker. One that will allow for us to provide guidelines to schools, churches, communities on how they can play their part. To provide support to our colleagues in Parliament on how they can play their part to integrate practices within their own constituencies. 2,000 students from 20 schools are being targeted for a pilot Coding in Schools program. Students between grades 4 and 9 will be taught coding. A memorandum of understanding was signed between the Ministry of Education and Amber Innovations Group Limited during a recent virtual launch. Minister Favel Williams says it's among measures to prepare students to adapt and compete in an increasingly interconnected and technology-driven world. To help our students adapt to these changes, we must continue to refresh our curriculum to ensure that the knowledge, skills and values taught remain current and relevant. 
It's expected that participants will also develop skills such as logical and critical thinking, problem solving, collaboration, teamwork, and mathematics. The one and a half hour sessions will be held twice weekly for three months. Classes are already underway and are being delivered using the online meeting softwares Zoom or Google Classroom. In other news, Attorney General Marlene Malahu Fort says the state has extended its motor vehicle accident backlog project to February 2023. The extensions granted are to enable consolidation of the gains made in eliminating the backlog of accident matters and as well as other matters in the General Legal Advice Division and to strengthen the existing framework in treating and dealing with matters on a timely basis. She says the project, which was launched in February 2020, successfully achieved most of the targets set in its first year of operation. The Attorney General says despite the pandemic, a total of 306 new accident cases were placed before the project team, along with an existing 287 older matters being reassigned to them. The Motor Vehicle Accident Backlog Project is currently being staffed by seven attorneys at law and one secretary. And finally, Prime Minister Andrew Holness has welcomed the unanimous agreement by CARICOM to appoint Dr. Carla Barnett as General Secretary. Mr. Holness says the appointment is a welcomed first in CARICOM history as Dr. Barnett is the first woman to hold the post. Dr. Carla Barnett, who is Belizean, previously served as a government minister, vice president of the Senate in Belize, governor of the Central Bank of Belize, and vice president of operations of the Caribbean Development Bank. The new Secretary General assumes her post on August 15, following current Secretary General Ambassador Erwin LaRock's tenure. And that's it for JIS News Today. I'm Stephen McHugh. Thanks for watching. So to my colleagues, I want to take this awesome opportunity to say Happy International Nurses Day. You are all superheroes in your own right. You have been showing up, producing the work, taking care of others, in spite of all the odds and the difficulties we face. Thumbs up, superheroes that you are. Keep the job going, keep on giving off your best, and we are all here to see each other through this pandemic. God bless you and have a wonderful day. Your first glance, and it's quite easy to describe a distinctive, often immaculate, and largely undecorated attire. Quite mundane for many, but their lives are far from the mundane. It's one that's quite astonishing most days, while other days come with its own bit of terrifying events. Really, there's nothing humdrum about their jobs. Hi, my name is Dominique Millen and I have been a nurse for 13 years. I chose nursing as a career because as a teenager I experienced a devastating loss. At the time I could not cope with the feelings I was experiencing, so I saw a way I could help the helpless. As a nurse I love being a part of a medical team that goes above and beyond to save patients to life. It is amazing to see the things that people do when you work together to achieve one goal. My name is Lillian Cook. I'm an acting ward manager, a registered specialist nurse, working at the Boston Monte Hospital for Children for over 20 years. The word nurse to me means caring, helping those who are sick, and the greatest pleasure is to bring them back to health. When I was a child, Growing up, I wanted to become a nurse. And at about the age 11, I read about Florence Nightingale. And that story was so inspiring, The Lady with the Lamb. And I decided my mind from there that that's a profession I would choose for life. So many of them stood and continued to stand as the backbone of the frontline workers in a pandemic that we knew too little about. 
while dealing with unprecedented strains and wounds that not even their gauze or surgical tapes could ever cover. I remember the first time I heard about the COVID-19 virus hitting the shores of Jamaica. I knew this was it. My name is Norvalyn Mendez and I have been a nurse for 14 years and I have never experienced anything quite like the pandemic. Working as a nurse um, during the pandemic at the hospital, it is very overwhelming to see that our medical resources have been stretched thin and it is very devastating to see that family members can be with the patients here. Working in the pandemic has been very taxing emotionally and physically. The demand, the work demand becomes very hectic. You have to show up, you have to give the same amount of care irrespective of the fact that the patient has a contagious illness. You work long hours, longer than normal, because sometimes there are staff members who are on quarantine or who have been exposed to the virus. And so you must now sometimes double up your time in order to give the care that the patients require. I lost a colleague to COVID-19 last September. It was very, very difficult for us as colleague to bear the news, feel the pain, especially when that person was so warm. It was panic driven. And when I heard that people were just dying, as if there was nothing that could spare life, it was really panicky for us. But when it came to our shores and we saw that people could really recover, yes, it touched us when we saw loved ones died, when they care for persons, and the end result is death. But we were much happy when we start getting positive results of people who come in, treated, and return home. Having lost a patient to COVID-19 has been emotional for me because the patient would have been in hospital over a period of time. And so, after having been in hospital over a period of time, you develop that patient care relationship. And so the patient would appear like a family member. And so when the patient dies, a part of you, a part of you is affected. Despite the losses, despite the faces of patients, far too many to even count or recollect, persons like these continue to respond to the call to save lives daily, hourly, and with every ticking second of a clock. So the lifelong lesson that I have learned as a nurse is that life is very fragile. You have it this minute and the next minute it is gone. And that is the reason I believe that each person should find the time to spend the time with those they love. Let them know in every way possible how much they mean to them because life is fragile. What motivates me being a nurse is that I can make a difference in a patient's life. I grew up with a strong family background of strong women. They always say you turn up and show up and give your best. I did not choose nursing. Nursing chose me. My advice to those who would like to pursue a career in becoming a nurse is that nursing is fun. It's a fun profession. You are never ever doing the same thing every day. If you are passionate about helping people to restore their health, to preserve life, to promote health, if you are passionate about humanity, this is a profession for you. Even if I'm tired, when I go home in the evening, or at every time my shift ends, whether it's a night shift that ends in the morning, I just have this strong, compassionate feeling to continue my work. And I always look forward for the life that I'm going to touch tomorrow. Unless you're in that room, you have no idea what you do. But I love my job. I was meant to be a nurse. I knew what I was getting into, but I chose it. And if I should start all over again, I will make the same choice. A nurse for life. So here's a space where these healthcare providers are notorious for working long, grueling hours, giving of themselves, working tirelessly to allow someone, anyone, to see into the promise 
of tomorrow. A nurse's task isn't easy. So how about showing them some appreciation as we go about our daily lives? Our present day realities are still pretty much shaped and controlled by the pandemic. Decisions like working from home are still the look of a nine to five for many individuals. But with spending more time indoors comes opportunity for hazards like fires to disrupt our lives. We want you to be safe. So we've packaged something for you on that. Take a look. <music> During this global pandemic, we have to remember the children are at home. It is extremely important to never leave them unattended. Make sure that anything that is flammable is kept away from them. A lot more cooking is taking place because a lot more work from home is, is taking place that has now become the norm. So be sure that you never leave your cooking unattended for any prolonged period. And when we say prolonged period, all of us will be mindful of whatever it is that we're cooking and the time it takes for boil over to take place. Boil over can actually start a fire. When boil over occurs, it is, reduce, it is depleting the water which is in the pot. A part of what the water does is that it maintains temperature and it absorbs the heat that is coming up from the direct flames. So when the water continues to dry out, you are going to get to a point where all the water is gone. Then whatever it is in the pot, if it continues, those things can become what we call embers. So they'll now be set ablaze in the pot. If it's a situation where you have, where you're frying, then the temperatures will continue to rise. And we, we all, we've seen situations of flambe, which is in a controlled setting. However, if it's not in a controlled setting, what you're going to have is that the fire will start right there on the stove. If you're cooking, please ensure that as much as is possible, you're tending to what it is that you're cooking. And I must point out very quickly, if you get home and you feel tired, don't tell yourself that you're going to be putting this on and take a nap. Take a nap first and then go and cook. During this time when we're working from home, Use the opportunity to get rid of all useless combustible material. We would have seen a ban on bags, plastic, single-use plastic bags. Remember the term regulator means to regulate. The, the contents of your gas cylinder are under pressure. The regulator ensures that that pressure is taken down to a manageable level and then the gas is fed to your appliance, in this case your, 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 your stove. So if the regulator is malfunctioning, it can cause leaks. And once there's a leak and you have open flame, that is a recipe for disaster. We must also point out that we've seen instances in households where persons tend to have the stove below a window and for some reason they have some nice decorative curtains. Of course, we do not recommend that. I want to use this opportunity to make a general appeal to all Jamaicans. First of all, you do not use sanitizers in your kitchens where there's open flame. A lot more devices are now requiring a lot more energy. So a lot more charging is taking place. A lot more devices might be plugged into plugs that would not have been accommodating this much load. Never ever overload electrical circuits or the sockets. We have to be mindful of the fact that overloading will cause a fire. One of the sure ways to start a fire is by going with the, the, the extension cords, those little brown and white extension cords. Those extension cords are not meant to carry any amount of load. 
it is best if you get a surge protector for all your appliances. The surge protector will, as the name suggests, take a surge in electricity and it will break the circuit to ensure that you are not starting a fire. So it is extremely important to ensure that you are purchasing the right tools for the right for the job at hand. Once they are not in use, plug them out. And it saves on energy as well. Because these devices take energy to keep them going. And for the energy to actually get to them, it must pass through the cords that you're using. And I want to point out for you very quickly as well, never ever use extension cords and appliances that have very short cords. There's a reason the manufacturer make your blender with a very short cord. It's because they want them plugged directly into the socket and not into an extension cord. Because they, they pull a lot of energy very, very quickly. And the extension cords might not be able to supply that amount of energy. And one of the ways to know if your extension cord is under pressure is by feeling the temperature of it. So you can use the back of your hand. If the extension cord is warm, it is sending a message to you. One of the last things I, I want to leave you with, as an organization, the Jamaica Fire Brigade is open and available at all times. If it is that you have any kind of questions, feel free to call us, feel free to go into any one of our fire stations, ask for information, uh, uh, um, information ask for safety tips, and we will accommodate you. And remember, in the event of a fire, the numbers to call is your nearest fire station or 110 or 112. And now a look at some frequently asked COVID-19 vaccine related questions and of course, Answers from the experts. The AstraZeneca vaccine at this time is being offered to pregnant and lactating women in the healthcare sector. So if you're a healthcare provider, then that's the recommendation. But we need to explain that just a bit. So in clinical trials, pregnant women as well as children are not usually looked at at all. It is until vaccines and other medications have passed through the phases and is now in the general population where thousands of persons get the medication that we then turn our attention to looking at trials in children and pregnant women. So we don't have a lot of data, but what we do know is the characteristics of this vaccine that we're talking about. It's non-replicating, which means that this vaccine will not cross over into the placenta and therefore the fetus is protected. This vaccine will also not get into breast milk and therefore the baby is protected from getting any ill effect of the vaccine. So we have the science of the vaccine that it is safe. And we also now know that healthcare workers in the, age, the reproductive age range, if they get the disease, they do so much worse. Not only do they do, themselves do badly, but they tend to have premature babies. So when you look at that risk benefit, then the risk of getting the vaccine, because it is safe, we know it's not getting into the uh, placenta, not going into breast milk, and we look at the impact of the disease on these very exposed persons, then we adhere to the recommendation of the strategic advisory group that healthcare workers should be offered. But as we get more information, then the vaccine may be offered to the entire population, uh, the entire pregnant and lactating population, but not at this time.
The issue of mentally ill persons has been very high on our agenda, as not just mentally ill, but also the homeless. So we have been making contact with the agencies who um, know where these people are and who they trust because there's a trust issue here. So there are some agencies, Salvation Army, that feed them. There's National Council for Drug Abuse that has surveys. So they are, whereas we cannot say exactly how they are going to be done, they have certainly factored into the conversation. And the issue of seniors who are unable for various reasons, and there's two groups. There's those that are physically impaired, um, and there are also those that are mentally impaired that would be very disruptive staying within a center. And we have given consideration so persons will stay in a car and somebody will go out to them. But they, you see, we have to do the observation. We have to do all of the other things that everybody has spoken to. But yes, so these things are being taken into consideration as we seek to vaccinate. will take the vaccine when you get your appointment and you will take your medications at the time that you normally do. Most people take it in the morning, certainly after breakfast or something, but you do have people that take it in the evening. So stick to your regular regime for your medications and keep your appointment for your vaccine. You can take it at any time, but there's another concern with older population. A lot of the medications, especially the hypertensive medications, send you to the bathroom. And a lot of older people do not take their medication when they're going out, whether it's to the health center and to get a vaccine. It will be okay if you don't take your medication because that's your normal practice, because you don't want to get caught on the bus or something. But take it as you would when you come home. I doubt it very much. We, I don't think that has been tested. Thousands of women have already got the vaccine and we're seeing no ill effect at all. And we are confident that over time, as we get more experience, because some women who have got the vaccine are, are now pregnant and they're being followed, we are confident that the vaccine will probably be safe even among pregnant women as well. The vaccine will protect you from severe illness, possible hospitalization and even death. And that is why we go right back to our IPC measures because your family need to also remain in their bubble that is safe and you will need to continue wearing your mask. So will everybody in the family uh, do the hand wash thing, sanitize and physical distance as appropriate. We're not vaccinating children. No, we're not because they weren't a part of the clinical trials. So as we vaccinate older persons with comorbid conditions, we have to continue to preach the message to our children, to our younger persons. We've got to wear our masks, we've got to do the hand wash, and we've got to physically distance until, until, until we have vaccinated enough persons in the population so that we have attained uh, herd immunity. We're always grateful for the time you spend with the Jamaica Magazine team. And as always, thank you for watching. As we continue working on tomorrow's show, all you have to do is just show up at this same time. You can also watch this episode again on the JIS's YouTube page and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. From all of us here at the JIS, I'm Theodore Henry. See you soon. This has been a production of the Jamaica Information Service, the voice of Jamaica.